Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very honored to bring the conversation I had with Tricia Rose. She is the Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies, Associate Dean of the Faculty for Special Initiatives, and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. She has a Bachelor's in Sociology from Yale, PhD in American Studies from Brown University. She has received numerous uh, fellowships from the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Mellon Foundation, and the American Association of University Women. Uh, she is the author of numerous books, including the most recent, Meta Racism, How Systemic Racism Devastates Black Lives and How We Break Free. And that is the book we discuss in the conversation. We start by talking about why racism uh, persists, how it still persists, uh, how it looks different from decades past. Um, and we talk about how racism evolves you know, within uh, and among institutions. We define meta racism. We discuss individuals versus institutions, understanding systems theory, colorblindness, and many other topics. I have to say this was, as I said in the conversation, uh, her book and the conversation was was wonderful because it challenged my thinking on a few things, pushed me in some ways, confirmed some things I had known and really just uh, super educational, super informative. Uh, she really is such a delight to talk to. I really uh, had so much fun talking to her. Uh, she has such a good good nature about her, a good way about her. She's obviously very brilliant. Um, and it was, a, it was a conversation that you know, it can be sometimes tricky uh, in certain contexts, uh, but between her and I, uh, it felt uh, very natural, smooth, and uh, I really, really enjoy having uh, the conversation about this topic, I mean, systemic racism or racism in general, uh, in this way. Uh, it was it was cordial. It was um, really trying to learn from each other, not trying to convince, not debate, not have an agenda. Really, just having a conversation, honestly, and and um, and that's I think how these conversations should be, where you know it doesn't have to uh, necessarily just you know nod our heads and agree with each other, but not also you know have this some big debate or something. Um, and so there's there was so much that we uh, converged on, if you will, <laughs> and uh, and she's she really is just super lovely, uh, just a joy to talk to. As always, you can find uh, this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. So get over there, like, subscribe, follow, tell your friends all the things. And um, now I bring you Trisha Rose. with Trisha Rose. Uh, Trisha, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to talking to you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. You've written a uh, fascinating book. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, pushed me in some ways. It uh, confirmed other things. It was just, it was a great book. It's super readable. So I really, really, really enjoyed it. I think it's a- uh, oh, Good. It's, I'm so it's, glad it's, to hear that. Thank you. It's, it's quite, quite necessary. I think this is the kind of book people should uh, should definitely get in them to to challenge and push and you know, reaffirm and remind and all those things. So the book is called uh, Meta Racism, How uh, Systemic Racism Devastates Black Lives and How We Break Free. This is out through the wonderful basic books. Uh, and so we'll talk all about it. Before we do, just tell 
listeners, uh, just kind of your snapshot of who you are professionally, academically, and uh, what you're currently up to. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am a, an, a PhD in American studies, which when I got that degree was really, um, you know, kind of, I was able to do African American studies at the PhD level, which was not that common many years ago. So um, I'm a native New Yorker. I study African American culture and social inequality. Um, I'm, I've written several books on the emergence of hip hop, you know, early on, and also an oral history of black women's sexuality. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in figuring out how agency can be expanded under oppressive conditions, right? Whether mm -hmm. that's cultural conditions or, as in this new book, meta racism, sort of societal conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, yeah, that's really a lot of what my work's been about. I've been teaching almost, I don't know, maybe oh, 30 years now, 25, mm -hmm. 30 years. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame. Probably, mm -hmm. I think. I don't know how that's possible seeing as I'm 19, but um, <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I enjoy teaching a lot and I, I really enjoy this research, especially this new project. Um, and so that's kind of, I mean, you know, that's basically the keep it married. Mm. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, that's enough bio. I think people can find me on the internet. Lord have mercy. You know, plenty of data. <laughs> that's wonderful. I mean, uh, I mean, I really, I mean, I, I, I know loosely you had written about hip hop and history and culture around that. Um, so I, I won't tell you to pick sides in the Drake Kendrick uh, battle that's going on right now, but uh, it has been interesting yeah. to get a rap beef. We haven't had one of those in a while, so at least I know, a good one. But you know, don't you wonder about two things: timing, of course, and two, why do they care about th yeah. wh why? Right yeah. now, if it's if it's like an art practice, then you do have to have some sort of energy to do it because you know right. a good beef is is a very important cultural exchange. If you have to be right in the right register, you can't go too far. Yeah. Pedophile might be a little off on yeah, the that's edge. A, that's a little far. It got uh, real like personal far. real fast. Oh, yeah, that's no more like, hey, beef, this is more like the whole cow, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not a side, it's the whole darn thing. And yeah. then it's sort of like, you know, it, it is an opportunity for a conversation, but not today. Maybe later on. Let's see how far we get with Meta. No, no, and no. Then, not, uh, and then not I, today. I, there is something interesting in that, though. I yeah, definitely yeah, think yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's an interest. I I agree with you ex exactly. Timing is. I don't know what what is uh, about the timing, but uh, it's an interesting it's, question. I have to. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Too much corporate involvement for me to be naive mm -hmm. about the possibility mm -hmm. of any number of reasons, mm -hmm. none of which will be easily discernible. To yeah, us. yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Okay, so you know, racism. It's uh, it's still around. Unfortunately, it's going to be around. Unfortunately. What's different now about well how racism looks at least in the United States, mm -hmm. and also how we talk about it or how we dialogue or how yeah. I feel like it's it's always been difficult. I don't think this time is more or less unique than other times. Of mm -hmm. course, there are things you know certain features that do make it you know, kind of different, but right. you know, we've been talking about this stuff for for a while. Definitely fifty sixty years in the U.S. at, at uh, some pretty rough moments. So yeah, why, why does it continue to persist? And, and why do you think we talk about it the ways we do now? Yeah, well, ooh, that's a big question there. Um, so, you know, for most of American history, we lived in a nation or we, we were part of a nation that publicly and without any discomfort were, uh, were firm believers that African American people of African descent were inferior to whites, and that inferiority was natural, normal, and should be maintained and reinforced in society. There was no gap between that and the principles we supposedly stood for, generally speaking. Of course, there were some who fought, right? But by and large. But after the civil rights movement, the, one of the great uh, successes of it was that it did shift the public expression of opinion against that point of view. So it was not so easy to wander around in 1978, 1985, 1995 and say something like, well, yes, black people are naturally inferior to whites and that it's the way it should be. It's biological, it's God ordained, whatever the excuses were. Mm. Um, so what happens now is that you have this sense that the laws were changed and that now we do not legally discriminate as part of our identity, right? Until until the Civil Rights Act and any number of other um, uh, laws were changed to make explicit, you know, discrimination, uh, proven discrimination illegal. Um, that move changed a lot of how people think about 
what makes racism or doesn't make something racism today. Mm. Because they're saying, look, there's a, a whole group of American people who will say, we change the laws. Whatever is happening now is sort of a vestige of the past. It's fading out. We no longer actually subscribe to the idea that discrimination is legitimate. In fact, the anti-affirmative action drive was largely about making the claim that it was reverse discrimination to account for a legacy of oppression. So that if black people were included in some intentional way, that was a discrimination to white people, for example. Hmm. But what happens is, instead of the society's organization of, of racism going away, the strategies change. And the continuation of the practice happens under different means. And, th- and those means are because they lack a direct language of intention, because they don't function in the way, say, Jim Crow did, signs, rules, uh, and punishment to whites for breaking those rules if they helped anyone black. I mean, it's a very severe system because that is not present, generally speaking. You have a sense that people, A, they don't see it, and then they get resentful, right? You get this, you know, white resentment. And then more importantly, is that you get less comprehension of what black people are actually facing, right? In other words, they don't see the whole picture, so they not only deny it, you know, reject it, or they minimize it. Even, you know, well-meaning people will say, well, yeah, it's true, Tricia, that you know, the eye, the eye contact of, you know, teachers shows that black boys are surveilled by the teacher's eye at five times the rate of any other kind of student. And that high level of constant surveillance actually increases their likelihood of being perceived as doing wrong in a greater degree because they're looking at them so much longer. And that may happen in your school, but you know, schools are doing well. Aren't they doing well now? You know, aren't we getting better? So there's this whole process by which you have to fight the way we tell stories, the sense of the history, and the fact that black people are actually part of a system that is so profoundly um, um, impactful and complex that it makes it very hard to find an enemy. So you can't say, there's Jim Crow, (laughs) you know? Mm. To me, and so that's why we're in a situation where we continue to have a conversation that's not about the same kind of racism that we that we would have experienced before. And you get a sense that racism is now just the vestiges of the past and that it's a personal individual belief. So that if you, for example, might have some racist beliefs and you know, maybe you know they are, maybe you don't. But the society as a whole does not function in a discriminatory way to black people. That's what people believe. That is untrue. It is actually the absolute misunderstanding. The society d- is organized to produce, um, whether it means to or not, I'm not talking about intention, I'm talking here about the matter of fact, that key institutions and policies work across areas to compound racial discrimination over time and across critical areas. And it's, it happens with almost no actual sign markers. Hmm. So, so what meta racism refers to in the title of this book is not meta meta, like, you know, it's everywhere, but Mm -hmm. the very specific meaning meta has in the context of systems theory. So when you say systemic racism, if you're being serious about that term system or systemic, you don't just mean structure. You don't just mean built in. You mean a set of forces and factors that are working <clears throat> interconnectedly to produce greater effects, meta effects, than any of those policies or areas could possibly produce on their own. So it's the relationships between policies and practices that produce this higher order effect. Mm-hmm. So the more they connect negatively in this case, the more they have this meta effect. And that is at the heart of what makes a system quite different. From individual belief, right? Individual personal bias. It's also what separates it from something more vague like structure. Hmm. So there's a few things there. So yes, you're pointing to some of the counters here, which which I hear as well. One of the things that I, you know, there's some 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 papers and you know research put out on you know what are the actual effects of you know. Uh, systems and things like that, and you know, it's just like anything else. You can find three papers to you know, you know uh, support whatever idea you want. 
But oh, I mean, oh, oh, that's true. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't right. find 190. Right, 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 right. Can't right, 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 find right. 500. Right. <laughs> I mean, I guess you right. could, but that right, just might right. make it true. Right, right, right. No, but 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 I, you know, I think it is it is it is fair to 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 take uh, you know certain counterfactuals or claims serious mm-hmm. if if they're with you know good intention. Mm-hmm. The, I'll come back. Well, I'll, I'll kind of sort of kind of talk about it here. I think one of the things there, there's a bunch of things, and you address them in the book, which is. This idea, I think there's there are these um these ways that uh, people will kind of counter things, you know, so so that you know you know uh, all black people don't have to be worse off than whites. Not every mm-hmm. institutional action has to demonstrate de- uh, discrimination, and personal support of racial uh, justice doesn't diminish white systemic advantages. So, so there's some kind of these myths of sorts. But one question I've always thought of is how do we understand where th- things change. So how things were done in the 40s and 50s and up into civil rights in the 60s. And again, there wasn't this magic moment, you know, after the Civil Rights Act was passed. You know, there was a lot of uh, reverberations into, into, the, into the 70s. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. right, right, right. So, but either way, there was, we can acknowledge the progress that was made on some pretty right. fundamental things, for sure. Right. How do, how does, is it, is it like a kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, this evolution of sorts of, okay, we put in policies, we put in places where there's progress, but now we're going to seep into other ways in which systems can still find ways to oppress people. So maybe we're not doing lynchings anymore because that's illegal and inhumane. Well, we the police do it now differently. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm saying, it, sure. Yeah, yeah, you're in, saying, in, right. In, well, we, don't, well, we didn't in, really allow it then either, right. but we did. Correct, right. correct. Uh-huh. Um, and, and other ways. Now we see it in, in ways of like, how do we see, um, you know, some of the practices of how, you know, black folks get, you know, certain loans for housing or where, you know, the types of housing that is available in certain places or access mm-hmm. to education or, or medical care or things like that. And you would say, well, this either, these are systemic issues, right? These are kind of these effects, these meta effects that you're talking about. Is that just something that organically happens? Like, okay, we can't do it this way anymore because we put all these policies in place. So mm-hmm. it has to go somewhere. So we're going to find all these other ways. Obviously, it's hard to to know intentionality of these things, but how do we see this morphing and evolving to where we see it now? I mean, we still see mm-hmm. it in 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 uh, the criminal justice mm-hmm. system and police brutality, and we see it in you know some of the things I mentioned. You with can housing. see it everywhere, but your question is, how does it happen? How does that? Like, what drives that shift? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look, I think it's a, a few things. There isn't. First of all, I don't think there's a little cabal of like twelve people who are <laughs> deciding the fate of the of the non white world. Okay, it's not a conspiracy theory. There's nobody. These these people in a in a in a in a room somewhere smoking cigars, planning it all out. Right? No, I that's know. not happening. I mean, in some ways, that would be way easier. <laughs> way easier. Um, what happens is that these policies are. They stand in for the comfort or discomfort of the majority and the group in power, right? Mm. So if you have a policy that looks race neutral, Mm -hmm. but disproportionately moves the harm of that policy onto unfavored people, in this case, black people. Mm. So let me say that again. If you have a policy that that, that the outcome of it, even though its language is race neutral, Mm-hmm. That the outcome, the negative outcomes, the negative consequences of that policy are channeled toward black people. It's not just that racists say, thank goodness. It's more that the benefits of not being surveilled, the benefits of paying lower mortgage rates, the benefits mm-hmm. of all of the positive sides of the policy, right? Those mm-hmm. are farmed toward whites. Mm-hmm. So it's the advantages that the policies maintain for the favored group mm. and the either maintenance or added disadvantage, the risks, the downsides, the hyper negative impacts are, are, are sort of concentrated. Mm. So, so why that is an important way of thinking about it is that if you talk to your average person, they'll, you know, they want all education to be equal, mm-hmm. but when you tell them that all these schools are horrible or I mean, I'm exaggerating, some schools in black communities are excellent, but they're yeah. disproportionately unaccredited. They're disproportionate. We can go on and on and on. Mm-hmm. But when you tell them that, they say, well, we don't, we don't want that to happen, but don't bring them fools over here. Mm-hmm. Right now. Why is it just because they're poor? Is it, if they were white, would they have said, don't bring them over here? 
um, what is the relationship between that? When you when you go to the town hall meetings and you listen to the recordings, it's quite clear mm-hmm. that a whole set of racial assumptions are being um, in, are being framed, and they fight like heck. Mm-hmm. Okay, same thing's true when you think about you know inca- incarceration, right? Mm-hmm. If if you are a, a white person and you see all this mass incarceration that black people are facing, you're very likely to think that's because black people do more crime. Now, I don't know how old you are, but prior to the iPhone, which you may or may not remember. I, I <laughs> certainly kidding. remember. I certainly remember that. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> okay, so prior to the iPhone, do you remember how hard it was? I'm sure you have friends who are black saying, this happened in my community. These police just jumped out of the car and beat the shit out of us. Oh, this yeah. happened. And people are like, come on, man. Oh, they yeah. would look at you like you were crazy. Like, mm-hmm. there's no way he did nothing. Mm-hmm. And here comes the iPhone. Mm-hmm. And now you can see it for yourself. That changed a lot. Mm-hmm. Because, but why didn't they believe black people? Because there was a pre-existing framework of interpretation about black criminality and black responsibility for crime that drove the passing of the negative policies like stop and frisk and things like stand your ground and the way it's implemented mm-hmm. um, and also reinforced it, right? It was based on it and it reinforced it because it did create a huge number of you know, people who had been marked by the system. Mm. So it's not that there's like a cabal of 12 with cigars, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's that what we, what, what happens is that the policies are so subtly um, interconnected that the effects they're having have to be monitored with a great deal of intention. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be, Hey, let's find someone, call somebody a name, or we found somebody in a smoking smoking gun memo that says, please don't hire any all fill in the blank. Right. Mm. You're not, they exist, but there aren't that many. What's really driving it is the system that I described. Mm. And that I think in order to see it, you have to change the, the understanding, the paradigm of what constitutes racism. And you have to be willing to pay close attention to what's actually happening. It's not going to be understood by just big brushes of paint. Mm -hmm. Right. We have to actually pay very close attention. So something that's interesting for me here, aside from the, how it morphs and evolves, but also is about people, right? So Mm -hmm. some people will say, well, it's not systems. It's people that are in the systems. You know, the people that are there, they're the ones that are the racist. They're the bigots. You know, it's not the system, right? It's, it's, you know, um, I guess I have two questions on that. So it's the same question in two different ways. If we have, you know, bad faith actors. In, that are making policy or that are in these you know institutions or in these systems and they're not considerate of outcomes for different groups you know uh, black folks and, and other uh, people of color could we say well because this kind of sort of gets to the intention right maybe it's inadvertently or it's an unforced error but it's still happening okay so there's you know, and then maybe there are still some folks that are intentionally trying to you know keep, uh, you know, uh, black folks from succeeding or they're keeping communities a certain way. So it doesn't, you know, whatever, there's all these ways of that, that this can happen. But then the other way, does it mean by nature? Well, if we have, you know, black folks or, or Latin folks or other folks that are in, in, uh, positions of power and they're dictating policies that it's just going to be great for, for folks. Cause then people will look mm-hmm. to, well, you know, we, we have some cities or local government or even, even some, some various states where it's been predominantly run by black folks or Latinos mm-hmm. or other people or of color, and they still have issues. So, right. it, so how much of this is, I guess the, the big question on both the positive and negative side is, how much can we say is the role of people in institutions or systems mm-hmm. versus the system itself on either the positive or negative? Okay. So the problem with that separate, even though I get this is a great question, the, the, the difficulty I have with that question, Xavier, is that we think that, you know, individuals can be, can have ideas that are not connected to the society they're in. And society can have systems that individuals are not perpetuating and participating in. Of course, they're all connected to one another in different ways. If we didn't have such a history of racism, you wouldn't have the belief system that individuals have that go with it, mm. right? Mm. They, they go together. Mm. What's different about the last 50 years, though, right, is that if we went out in the public right now and asked many whites, do you think society is racially fair? They would say yes. 
And there, and many, not all. Yes, yeah. Trust me, I there's several that's, studies you can do the work. I'm not going to do it again. That, that's wild. <laughs> trust me, to they me, would though. say they think it's racial, or it's eighty. What would you say? It's eighty percent think that we're almost a hundred percent racially fair. Eighty percent. Uh, look, pull out the front in the book. It's a footnote. Anyway, <laughs> that's, so that's uh, wild. That's yeah, so wild know. that people wait, really now, believe wait, that. Wait, hold on, it's even more insane. They'll, and then there's like a smaller percentage that says we've actually gone too far. It's actually reversed. So now, at the same time as people want to tell you they're not they're not racist in any way, they're actually comfortable with the with the way society's organized because they think it's a natural formation because the way we talk about mm-hmm. racism becomes a conversation about individuals. So we lose sight of the thing they're in. So let's just take Mike Brown. I would imagine your listeners recall the 2014, you know, horrible situation where Darren Wilson and mm-hmm. Ferguson, uh, yeah. you know, shot uh, Mike Brown multiple times, killed him, left their, the police left his body in the street for hours and a hot summer day. Now, th- what was the main source of our conversation about Mike Brown? Before we knew about the Cigarellos theft, Right. Yeah. He was already a big thug. He's a big kid. Right. Wouldn't any cop be scared of him? You know, shouldn't I mean, you have to give Wilson a give him a break. He's a short guy. They were not that he was not that short. They were pretty similar. So all this thing was a one on one. What was his value? What was Darren Wilson's attitude trying to find his racism? So what I do in this book is say, OK, we can talk about Darren Wilson for a little while. He's relevant. He's not irrelevant. Had another sure. cop been in the driver's seat, maybe this would have never happened. I don't know. But the things that really put Mike Brown in profound harm, of which Dan Wilson was one piece, is the entire role of continued significant housing discrimination, where where Ferguson County is in North County is you know all where there's one area where across fifty little you know hamlets and towns all the black people live and white people live somewhere else. All the schools are dramatically segregated. The schools in Normandy that Mike Brown went to from kindergarten to the end of high school were never accredited. None of them. He spent his whole life in schools so bad that the own the system itself couldn't even pass them. Mm. And then when he and then when those who wanted to valorize him and say Mike Brown was going to college, he was one of the lucky ones who escaped. Mm. Right. Where was he going? He was going to a for pay, for profit, basically vocational school mm. that was training kids for things that were obsolete and, t- and making them more po- more poverty stricken than mm. they were when they came to this so called for profit school. Oh, are they all just in Ferguson? No, seventy, eighty percent of these for profit institutions are hovering in and around black communities. Mm. Why? Because they're desperate for opportunity. And because they're vulnerable to imagining they could get the training they need to break in. And so they take more money. So part of it is a normalized form of constant extraction of resources, of, of, of believing that punishment is an appropriate response to everything that is going on for, for an African-American. Um, and containment, right? That is to say, make sure they're segregated. Make sure we don't know anything about what's going on. We're keeping them out. So what I want people to see is that if we got rid of every individual terrible incident with the police. Mm. It would be remarkable, but it would not stop the Mm. profound health crisis. It would Mm. not stop the the uneducation, the extraction of intelligence, really. You know, it's almost like school is punishment (laughs) the way way schools are going. Um, So, you know, that wouldn't stop any of that. So Mm. what is it? Now, it'd be great, but when you understand these things are all interconnected, we punish kids in school, black boys the longest and the earliest followed by black girls. Um, And then we do this and then, you know, we have the health problems. We have the mental health issues that come from trauma. I mean, if you've ever seen someone, I've not been pushed to the ground by the police, but what's happening on these campus protests, you have, you know, 60 year old white women who are just being professors of, you know, economics and philosophy being pushed to the ground. They look shocked. Like they're like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. Like it, you know, it doesn't like imagine that now 30, 40 times from a Mm -hmm. kid on with the level of malice that you know accompanies it frequently. So when you look at all of those things, and then, you know, all the other policies, I don't want to bore your folks, because I mean, you really have to read through it to get to it. Mm-hmm. You can't possibly think that a set of individuals could produce this kind of harm, mm-hmm. right, on an individual level. Mm-hmm. Not possible. Mm-hmm. Not possible. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're you're providing the the context of this, which is kind of the point you said, which is which is interesting. What you said there, like, look, if you if you take all the, the bad causes, apples, I'm really the, saying the causes and the context. Yeah, yeah, because you're saying even if you take the bad apples of bad individuals, they still live in a system. They still live in an environment. They still live in these things which are contributing there. And I, so I'll tie it to the thing you first said of you know you go out in the street and you ask people you know do do we think we're better. Uh, you know, with racial, you know, uh, uh, progress, whatever it's the 80% or whatever it was that people said. Mm -hmm. I just feel like it's, mm, I guess there's two things when I, when I hear all sides of this, the first thing I hear is that I, I, I can imagine is people, I think a lot of people think of racism as whether or not like, I feel like there's, there's a pros and cons to this, I guess, but do I say racial slurs to somebody or not? Right. That's mm -hmm. like exactly. a very right. obvious right. thing. That's mm -hmm. obviously racist. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, or, you know, certain people sitting in the back of a bus, they can only drink from this water fountain. They can only go to this laundromat, that kind of stuff. Very mm -hmm. obvious. And everything outside it. So we don't have those things in that specific way anymore. There's other well, ways we, in which things right. are segregated, well, we, but yeah. But, but not as obvious as the images we have in our head. And I feel like a lot of folks feel like, so when they make these statements, it's, well, yeah, yeah, it's, we, we don't have that anymore. We, we got rid of that. And yeah, people don't go around, you know, throwing around all these racial slurs like it was before. And, and it's very taboo to say that and all that rightfully so. So people then walk away with that. So how do we, I mean, this is part of what your book's trying to do, but how do we get to the place where you say, okay, that's, Certainly, a type of racism, but that's not the only racism that exists. There are it's so not many the most other elements. When it, yeah, it's not the most impactful when it comes to long term opportunity outcomes and, you know, and true equality. So I think, you know, for me, it's like the reason, the reason we think that personal behavior is the only kind of racism left mm -hmm. is because people who have been fighting the improvements that have been made, people who've been wanting to challenge the opportunities that many have fought for for black people they have continually narrowed the terrain for what can constitute racism mm -hmm. and the more you narrow the definition the less responsible anybody is say that again the more you narrow the definition of what equals racism mm. the less responsible society is organizations are Right. Mm. If, if, if the only racism is how what name you call me and whether or not I personally hear this as a slur, then who's responsible? You. Mm. But mm. if you and I are embedded in the system that has created all of this profound disparity and disadvantage for me in this case. Right. We're just using ourselves as proxies. Then we have to start saying, well, wait a minute. Redlining isn't really over. And if black people were forced in redlining, not just to be separated from whites, but that all the assets in their neighborhoods were devalued over the length of their ownership, not increased in value. If 70 percent of the people who live within a mile of highly toxic commercial industry are black in cities. Right. That's how redlining worked. It wasn't just away from whites. It was close to harm. Nobody wants to live over there. The air stinks. Oh, yeah. So why do we have asthma? Mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. why do we have other respiratory issues so much mm. so then you have to start saying well wait what are we going to do about that not only do we have a concern about what happened in the past but this is an intergenerational crisis the parents die early or they don't get proper medical care because of other things that have been legalized and allowed to continue mm. so when you pull the lens out and you say yes there's individual racism there's interpersonal racism and then there's systemic or inst there's institutional racism next, which is a given institution, not the whole society. Mm -hmm. And then there's a system approach. If society consistently generates outcomes of major disparity, it is the, it, you cannot, from a systems perspective, ignore those outcomes. You can't just say they're not what we intend. Because with systems theory, no matter what the subject is, Whatever happens the most consistently is what that thing is designed to do. Mm. Even if there's no one single architect, right? Because mm. mm. it just wouldn't do it. It doesn't matter if it's positive, negative. They don't even, it's not even about race. I'm saying conceptually, any system 
that continually has certain outcomes over and over and over again is doing what it's supposed to. Do you think some of this is, I mean, I I don't really care that much about it, um, but I know many people do, and maybe that is or isn't harmful or hurtful. Do you think it's people get kind of mm, like afraid of, maybe it's, is it, I know this sounds like such a silly thing to ask, but is it, is it just the, 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 the negative PR behind racism, right? If you call something racist, we have all of these associations with it. If, if we, cause I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Anytime I've described systemic racism to somebody, but I don't use that word. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I could see that. Wow. That's terrible. Yeah. That's awful. Mm-hmm. And then I, if I say, well, typically we just call that systemic racism. No, yeah. no, no, no. Do you, right, I mean, right. no, that's, it's a, been a, that's been a campaign. There's been uh-huh. a concerted campaign to G- delegitimize this generation's efforts at significant social movement and change. Mm. They did it to the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. We romanticized Mm -hmm. that era as Mm -hmm. part of our fantasy that we were happy and comfortable with those changes and that we thought it was about time Mm -hmm. when in fact King was not only assassinated, but every possible effort was made to change the language, to reduce the impact, to Mm -hmm. limit the amount of time we would do anything positive, right. To make Mm -hmm. the changes stick. Mm -hmm. Um, So when, there's not only been a, you know, a campaign, but it's been a concerted effort to treat those who are asking uh, us to pay attention and to redress them somehow, make changes, that we are harming society, that, that mm. this is not even happening, mm, right? That's yeah. why we're banning books. That's why we're making sure there's certain words that are not acceptable to be used, mm-hmm. because the whole purpose is to make racism disappear from view, mm. not from practice, mm-hmm. from view. And they made a tremendous progress, Mm. right? But here's what I think I tried to do in this book, which I do think sets it apart from many other very good books on the on the subject. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is, I take the concept and the and the theory of systems very seriously. I'm like, okay, let's just say Mm -hmm. this is a systems question, Mm -hmm. not a race question by itself. Ask any engineer who uses systems theory in their practices and, you know, anyone who's working in STEM generally, they're very familiar with this. I'm not that type of scholar. I don't do, you know, math and algebra and whatnot. Not not a good look. (laughs) But what I do is say, let's take all the principles. Mm. Let's see if they apply. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, well, why get all worked up? If you're serious, you're going to think. You're not just going to read, you know, just knee jerk response. Look at it. Tell me now that you know what a system is, because most people don't. Mm-hmm. I didn't know fully until I read for a number of years on the whole general area. So now you're going to say to yourself, okay, I don't need to have a knee jerk thing because somebody told me to hate the word system, mm-hmm. the word intersectionality, the word, uh, you know, structure, the mm-hmm. word, um, uh, what's the other one? Woke. I mean, they just, whatever black folk are saying, they're just going to find a way to stigmatize it mm-hmm. to make sure, to make sure of this. And this I think is so important. We do not come into this world with racist beliefs. We cultivate them in our society. We cultivate Mm. the beliefs and the practices. Mm. Mm. If you teach people about how racism works, your your kids don't become guilt ridden and crying and hysterical. They become agents of of, of participation for change. Mm. That's what I think a lot of people saw with the George Floyd summer. Mm -hmm. They saw a global, multiracial, international organization of humans who said this is not going to happen anymore and we need to make some changes. Now, yes, they focused on police a lot because many of the issues were about the police. But if you educate people about racism and you don't and and you don't just call it oh one bad apple, right? You know, one bad apple means who needs a movement? Just send them to court. The judges will handle it. The the right the the, um the, the, the lawyers will handle it. But if it's a system Now we have to make some changes Mm -hmm. and that agency is fueled by the knowledge of what's happening now and how it's being hidden. So I have a a kind of faith that maybe could be perceived as naive that some percentage of people of every color and every background will look at this and say, Oh, okay. This is, I'm being manipulated actually Mm -hmm. into believing that this is a normal way to distribute harm, to distribute assets to create opportunity. This is a reasonable way to function, right? Once you really look at it carefully, you see it's 
a complete lie. Mm -hmm. But it's been so well crafted, not so much by what it says, but why it, what it won't say when mm -hmm. things happen. No context given. Mm -hmm. So I have a belief that people will see that and that they'll see this other attack, which has been, by the way, described by those who are engineering it very explicitly. Mm -hmm. Right? They don't say there's no secret. <laughs> it's not a secret. So I just think we need to pay more attention, understand systems theory, and then understand how good people could be very much benefiting from a system of race, racism that produces racial you know, discrimination and yet not want it to be happening and yet benefiting from it and not even knowing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found so you're referencing some of the things you talk about in the first chapter, which I found very convincing because it was one of those things where it was just what you said. Well, let's just look at what systems are, what a system is. What is it in, in reference to a structure? What does that look like with, you know, with outcomes? And I think if you just take the, you know, kind of the, the basic understanding of what these things are, and then you, I mean, it's not quite plug and play, but you plug a lot of these variables in there. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, that's what it is. Like you can't, unless you need to just create new words or new language, that's what right. it is. And I think it's, <clears throat> it's frustrating at least uh in some conversations i have because it's you're fighting all of the uh, negative propaganda that comes out against you know systemic yeah. racism or all these things and i've tried to tell this to some people and it's hard because people yeah. you know it, it fits their emotional you know whatever resistance to some things and and but it's just like oh you know well we, we shouldn't we, sh we shouldn't, uh, that's this kind of thing, or we shouldn't believe in that, or oh, that's really extreme kind of ways of thinking, or that's, so well, what are we really talking about here? Like, I mean, yeah. I think, I think, yes, you know, maybe there are certain groups of people that are, yes, very yeah, extreme, course. that do an all or nothing thing. Okay, but that's not what this is. Like, that's not, no. you can't allow right. that on any side of things to, to, to dominate that's what it is. There's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, these things are, are relevant. But as long as we're very clear on what we're meaning and all these things, that's why I really loved that part of the book because it's like, okay, this is what systems are. This is how this works. And so then mm -hmm. here's how we understand where these things are. And, you know, unfortunately, people people kind of just, you say systemic racism, it's like a trigger word for them. You're just like, oh, mm -hmm. God. Everybody. Isn't that stunning? It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I will say, you know, I started this book, I started the, the project because it's a book that's part of a bigger project. But I started the whole project years before George Floyd, years before systemic racism was in the public eye. And I was like, you know, this needs to be more clearly drawn so that mm -hmm. we don't get that knee jerk response. But, you know, it took off. The response happened so fast and people were primed mm -hmm. for it because mm -hmm. anything that disrupts this and makes people uncomfortable right, mm -hmm. is going to be easily stigmatized. And you know, I'll just say one quick thing, and then I have yeah. a question for you on this. So yeah, yeah. it started really as a kind of a handbook related to this experience you described, which is you're talking to people, you feel like you're having a perfectly reasonable conversation. They seem like a nice person. You're having a beer in the, in the airport, in the lounge, or you're mm -hmm. sitting next to them and, you know, in some kind of air, air fly, airplane seat or Amtrak or whatever. And you have a nice little chat, and then something comes up, and then they tell you this thing. It's like totally negating what you know to be true. Mm -hmm. And you see, you hear all the trigger language, right? You hear all the, the extremist rewriting mm -hmm. and you're like, well, what do I do with this? Right? How am I going to penetrate this framework without getting into a fight and messing up my nice happy hour train ride? Right. <laughs> right. So I thought, you know, if I just had a handbook, mm -hmm. right, that could just be like, look, I know the title is going to trip you out, but you know, you got to have big title that may gets attention. It's America. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Just yeah. ignore the title and tell me, just read it and call me. Here's my business card. Mm -hmm. Or you're at work and you just are sick of these three people who come and poke you at lunch every day to tell you, wow, what was racist today, buddy? You know, <laughs> just put it in the box and say, don't talk to me about this until you've read it. Right. And th so that was actually an agenda for me. It just as a spiritual intention, like mm -hmm. I want to give people an accessible tool that is showing them, look, I'm not here to just stack the deck. I'm asking, well, how do these things connect? And then I show you how they connect. And then I provide you lots and lots of sources to show that this is a very common uh, data point in the field, mm -hmm. right? And when you assemble them and you see how they work together, it becomes a legit uh, interpretation. I'm not saying it's the only thing happening in society. I'm not saying everybody black is at the bottom. I'm not saying all this highly dramatic stuff. Yeah. But tell me how you experience when, when people say these things and you see, oh, they're triggered by the word. 
-hmm. What do you do? How do you get out of it? Like, what's your strategy? Yeah, how do you get into it? Either way, (laughs) for me, I mean, I think it's it's sort of similar to what you were saying. I have to look at usually the intentions of people, or I try Mm -hmm. to, I try to somewhat intuit or ascertain that. If it's somebody that legitimately, like, I don't mind disagreeing with somebody, and I certainly don't take things really personal, but for me, it's more of okay. Um, if this person is very radical or very extreme for any, any side of the spectrum here, I'm usually going to ask from the beginning, okay, you know, I don't mind having this conversation, but I I just want to make sure that we're kind of on even footing here. Um, you know, you have some strong beliefs. I might as well. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that we keep this kind of you know, uh, uh, fair, fair, fair play of sorts. And that we can really dialogue about it. Even if we don't agree, if I get the sense that someone is just kind of telling me like pretty radical talking points, or they're trying to, you know, proselytize and convince me of whichever thing I usually will kind of say like, you know, I mean, I'm not as passionate about it as you, but I respect your beliefs and I kind of will just, you know, steer away from it. But if it's somebody that's really good faith and they'll say, yeah, I do have, I have beliefs, but yeah, I can have conversation with people that are different or maybe have a different approach. Okay. And then we usually have a pretty honest conversation and we say, okay, and I might disagree or they might disagree with me. And, but we can, I usually try and for me is how can I understand I have my position. How do I understand this other position if it is that different or find where there's a kind of overlap there? And I think if people are trying to do some version of that on the other side, it's usually pretty fruitful. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really, but, yeah, when people get real, really, really like they have like six talking points, they're very passionate. There's like no way they're going to change anything. Uh, that's more of like, ah, it's probably not going to be productive. Yeah. Usually my, that my, my thing. Yeah, I, see, I hear what you're saying there. I guess, you know, for me, I find that um, the topics that are the most difficult to have that kind of curious, somewhat balanced conversation about are the topics that most connect to the identity of the person who's very fraught about it. Sure, yeah. So, you know, race, gender, sexuality, right? Things, religion, mm-hmm. things that are very um, important to people are going to make for more likely high end, high stress in the lock years. Yeah. The thing about race is that the way it works is that whites don't understand themselves as racialized subjects mm-hmm. the same way people of color do. Mm-hmm. So we know that this is a, a, a an issue. So, and so we don't have to be convinced into like race matters as a category of analysis. Race matters as an experience in the world. Because whether you think you're black or not, as long as other people think you're black, you're going to have a different life. Yeah. Now yeah, yeah. that, you know, that's not a shocking insight to a person of color. They're like, okay, what are we doing? Kindergarten here? <laughs> but a person who thinks that they're beyond race, that race doesn't exist, they don't see color. They don't know what you're talking about. That's the conversation that's going to be very tough because you have to first educate them about their own reality of racial experiences. Not every moment in their life is a life of racial luxury. No, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but whatever's happening to them, is happening a little bit worse or a lot worse to the to, to black folk, whatever it is categorically. Mm-hmm. So you know that's that getting that recognition means you know going through the muck of their of racist indoctrination, literally, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Of a hierarchy, you know. And so to try to help people see that, like, look, I see people as individuals as much as I can, but I also know what it means to be in groups. I don't sure. stigmatize individuals. I have no. I really hope the book doesn't read like I'm on some, you know, what do you call it? Like an agenda agenda or, a, you know, I have some kind of thing. I really just say, look, this is a serious issue. We're never going to have a peaceful, you know, reasonable society until we figure some of this out. And the harm it's causing people is remarkable. Mm. And the harm is so normalized and naturalized that you, you, you literally have to remind people that they, for example, live in a city and don't have a single black person in any part of their lives. Mm-hmm. In a city, mm-hmm. I went into a Rhode Island. Admittedly, it's not a city, so it's outside of Providence. So I'll give it some slack. But <laughs> there was a new, really cool bakery opening up, and I was like, "Yeah, finally, one in this town." Mm-hmm. Fifty people there opening weekend. I was in line for tw- thirty minutes. I was the only black person in the entire place. Mm-hmm. That included everybody even working there. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, usually you'd be like, well, at least a brother's washing dishes, <laughs> which is still an offense. You know what I mean? But at least he's present. There was, I, I, I made a circle in my, you know, like 360 in my standing line for like three times. I was like, this can't be, there has to be one. Mm-hmm. I was like, if I hadn't come here today and they wouldn't have missed or noticed a thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting what you say about that. I think it's maybe a little bit of temperament. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, I was a pretty fundamentalist Christian for many, many years, about two decades of my life. And I think as I've gotten older and as I've, I, I like to listen, I like to listen a lot to people. And some people say, well, what's your opinions or, you know, these ideas. I'm, I'm a passionate person, but in terms of ideas, it's a small list. I'll be mm-hmm. honest. Um, I just don't. It's not, I, I, I can, I, I see a lot of different things. And so I care about things. I care about mm-hmm. the planet. I care about, you know, a, a racial discrimination and injustice. I care about, I care about these things. They're usually, usually what I tell people is if you care about it at a nine or 10, I probably care about it at like a six, right? And, yeah, and that's, that's not to fair. say, it's, that's not to say it's that's important fair. to me, but it's like, yeah. the things I care about is like, I get really passionate and worked up about gerrymandering. And that's like mm-hmm. such a wonky, like boring. Yeah, but that's no a real cares. major issue but, when you look at it from that's impact. But that's outcome. but that's super, super important to me, and yeah. I'm, I'm very much on that. Okay, fine, but you know, but I'll give you an example, right? So, like, I guarantee you, um, and it's kind of one other thing I want to ask you about here is, but I guarantee you, there's going to be people that I'm friends with that are going to listen to this, and 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 they'll either say it publicly or privately. They're going to say. That was an okay conversation with uh, with uh, with Rose. That that was that was cool, but he didn't push back hard enough. You mm-hmm. really just you know kind of nodded too much in agreement. And then I'm gonna mm. get I'm gonna get the 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 DMs and the and the text and the and maybe the public messages <laughs> of, you know, I don't feel like you agreed with her enough. Maybe maybe how, what what is your side on this, right? And I'm gonna get that side of things. And I know, I'm gonna yeah. be and, and it's it's one of those things. And it's like. I, I mean, obviously I care about it. It's fascinating. It's really interesting. It impacts us. Um, but I think some of it is, is, is a little bit of temperament of sorts and people get very, you know, and I, and I, and I respect it. I, I totally respect it. But it, for me specifically, I think it is one of those things where I'm like, I, I do want to hear uh, where people are at. And I want to be an important person where people can, a sort of kind of receptacle of like, I want to be able to download those different ideas and positions. And I, I do feel uh, personally, I mean, you and I aren't that, I'm not that far off from where, from where you're at, mm-hmm. but it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, but I want to be able to, to have the space to hear to other folks as well, which is interesting. So, so, me, so, so yeah. there's this other piece about like, uh-huh. so I can tell you this, this is, this is really interesting. I'm curious here on this place. You sort of mentioned in the book, but like there is, and I'm not fully on board with this, you know, like I, I, I like entertaining the idea. It's interesting. There are people of color Mm-hmm. And 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 white folk that do this color blindness thing. I, I have yeah. I have I have a few good friends that are mm-hmm. that are people of color. That, Definitely, that, that, they that, feel that, like that, that's that, going to that, help them be that, treated that fairly. It. Yeah, that they push. They say, "I really think this. You know, race is just a construct, and this and this and this mm-hmm. and this." And yeah. they're going to hear this, and they're going to roll their eyes because of how I'm talking about it. Right? But I don't know what what do you think about this kind of thing? Because I I have I do have some opinions about it. I mean, I'm not I'm not really for it. I can. I think people that are good faith and really thoughtful can have some interesting ideas on it. But I, I, in terms of practice, in terms of how we do things, yeah, I'm not, I'm not signing up for that. Yeah. But I don't know. What do you think about this discussion? Yeah. And certainly with people of, of color. Yeah. Well, yeah, I definitely will, will get to them specifically. So, I mean, look, the notion of colorblindness is that, um, I mean, there are lots of different ways to think about it, but the core definition, whether it's a conservative version of colorblindness or say a liberal application, mm-hmm. is to not to try to evaluate uh, people and, cir- and, and circumstances, to treat people legally and interpersonally as if you, there's no color involved, mm-hmm. color not being a factor. Now, if we're talking about an ideal, yeah. From a legal standpoint, mm-hmm. I actually don't have a huge amount of stake in that. I'm a little more like a six or a five, like you might be on mm-hmm. some other topics. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, if it can be executed properly, I mean, okay, sure. But it can't be that we have a principle of 
I'm going to be treated as if I'm not a fill in the blank, black person, brown person, white person, because I want to practice colorblindness, even though race has a huge impact on everything that happens. So then you're basically saying, I don't want to measure discrimination. I'm invested in not knowing that I'm being discriminated against or that I'm my my advantages are, are paying off intergenerationally. And I don't want to talk about it because I want to say I saw you as the same as me. I'm like, you know, so it's, it's not the ideal, although I do have some problems with the ideal and I can tell you what they are. Mm-hmm. It's not related to this, but it is it's related to some other elements. But if it, we're talking about an ideal, that's one thing. If we're talking about reality, then it's a, it really is a kind of violence, right? To say, I don't see how important race is going to be to you because it's going to shape everything about your life. Not everything in every moment, every piece going into a bank. And you're not always going to know in the yeah. moment what's mm-hmm. happened. A lot of this research is about 20, within the last 20 years, people didn't really know mm-hmm. all of this that's been going on. So what I would say to your black friends is very specifically, look, I understand the drive to feel like there is an objective way of measuring that could um, happen consistently in such a way that I would know that I was being appreciated for who I am as an individual. But, you know, I don't know any society on earth that doesn't have a system in some way or another that where there's some sort of hierarchy of value, ethnic fighting, religious hierarchy, gender hierarchy, sexual orientation hierarchy, and at the fear of death in many places, um, race, obviously. Um, so, you know, if that's true, then what we have to do is see this as a problem that needs to be attended to so that we can overcome the, either the subconscious or unconscious bias or the way the system generates discrimination, even when you're not expecting it, so that more of who you are in all your fullness can be appreciated and the greater chance we have for something like a more objective evaluation. Mm. Okay. But we're not in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so this is, so I'm very closely aligned with you on this. So that's basically my same argument. Uh, I think the only difference there is when I've talked to people about this, uh, is they make a distinction between like the cultural aspects. So they just don't like the racial kinds of elements of things like mm-hmm. colorism, skin color, or more than that. Et cetera. And I agree aspirationally. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. I think we're not there yet. We're not going to be there in 10 years or 20 years. So I want to live now in reality. And so, you know, the pushback is, well, we got to start somewhere. We have to get that. Okay. If that's, I think if you have good faith, sure, maybe. But I guess the other thing about this, though, is that I've asked this question. Uh, I'm forgetting who I asked this with. I was like, so so wait a minute, but what about like culture and and tradition and history? It's like, well, no, 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 we want to keep that. But that's not race to me. <laughs> oh, right? yeah, that's, right. That's, mm-hmm. that's something yeah. else. And that's I'm like, because whiteness isn't. Wait, wait, you mean oh, for okay. black people? Yeah, yeah I've, heard, I've heard this from, from, from people of color, too. I see. Well, you and know, it, again— and then, so there it's like, okay, so what are we doing here? We're splitting hairs about how we define things. Like the catch all yeah. is race. Okay. We could talk about different ways that we could talk about that. But then it's like, then you have to convince, you know, people around, you know, the U S or around the world that how they mean race is not how you're meaning it. And you're choosing to use different things. It's like, all right, you have no, that. The, have no, the other that. thing is that by, because race got created, right. The people who, people who are being um, harmed because of its function. Mm-hmm. I've had to figure out how to how to to believe in themselves to create value for themselves along the axis of 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 race where they were pitted to be at the bottom of yeah. that value structure. Yeah. So they're saying, look, of course race has to matter, many people say, because I can't ignore my race. Every everywhere I go, it's relevant. So I have to have a positive relationship to it. I have to value myself and reject this other system of belief uh, about who who's beautiful. Who's a frightening, who looks criminal, uh, or even within brown and black communities that darker skinned people face significant disadvantages. These are truths. They are facts. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, you know, when someone says we have to start somewhere, where are they thinking about starting? Mm -hmm. What, Mm -hmm. just their own personal belief structure? Like, I'm Mm -hmm. just going to not see color? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I just want them to, I would encourage your friends or or your listeners who believe that to walk that through all the way, just in a given day. like. Mm-hmm. What does that actually mean? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and the second thing that I think I would say about why, um, you know, my, my main issue with colorblindness and with racism is that it doesn't break. It doesn't really crack open the binary. It's mm. either you're focusing and attending to racism, which I do a lot of. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a cul- culprit <laughs> or you ignore it like it's not happening. Mm. Right. And neither one of those things are true. We are all more than the racial gendered groups, religious color groups that we were born into. We're more than those categories. Of course we are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're also deeply defined by them, whether Mm -hmm. we want to say so or not. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. like you don't have, you know, in theory, it would be called interpolation, right? It's like, how does society interpolate you? Like what people think of you shapes who you are. You can't pretend it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can fight against it. You can build protections. You can build alternatives. You can find ways of being resilient. But you can't just act like it doesn't matter, like it didn't happen. It is part of social formation. We're human animals. We live in large groups. That's what we do. And mm-hmm. we know who we are through those messages of those environments. So for me, it's not like, could we just do color, you know, colorblindness tomorrow? Mm-hmm. It's that what colorblindness would do in this moment is just reinforce the blindness of whiteness. Mm-hmm. It would be quite color aware. But it would just not say and evaluate the ways it's happening. Mm. So I guess the key is how do we keep the principle that we're more than all these categories? We're more and we're more complex and we're individuals. And we are embedded in categories not of our making. Yeah, that's to me, that is the I mean, you're you're expressing the question way better than I could. But that's exactly the question I have as well is I, I fully agree with you on that is I that's that's the question. And, you know, I think, you know, that's, that's why we have to try and figure it out. There's a, there's a, I've had two conversations with him actually. And the, the, the last one was, was really fun. Um, Brian Lowry, he's a sociologist out at, uh, I think it's Stanford. I could be wrong on that. Mm-hmm. He's out, he's out on the West coast. And he wrote this book, um, oh, I'm forgetting the title, but he basically does the social construction of the self, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, we're all, who we are is all based on where we're at in, in our society, mm-hmm. in our environment. Right. And we had a fun, fun exchange. I mean, we, we got, mm-hmm. it got really fun. It was, if, you, if you listen mm-hmm. to the conversation, you can hear, you know, I'm going back and forth, you know, because I have ideas about the self and what that is, and he has ideas. Mm-hmm. And we do agree on a lot, but then we, we, mm-hmm. we diverge. It's, it's a great conversation. But it's that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, we, we are in a society where there are categories, whether we like it or not, that are influenced by how other people right. see us. Like, that's, that's a real thing. And that's yeah. why the colorblindness stuff is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nice conversation if people mean well with it is, yeah, but like, if I'm, whether I like it or not, it, there is more of a possibility or chance that if I go into a 7-Eleven or Walgreens or, you know, a, a store and I'm a darker uh, uh, skin color, there's a better possibility, unfortunately, that I'm going to be treated differently. Like mm-hmm. that's a reality. Like I could believe right. in colorblindness all day, but that's still a reality. Right. Like I, that's it's just not yeah. the world we live in. Like I just. Right. <laughs> so you know what's interesting is like we we give people who focus on colorblindness as if that that values ideal is going to just make society change, right? If you just have it, but if you said okay, colorblindness is our goal. Let's just we're just having a thought experiment here. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> some people don't get confused about my my actual beliefs because <laughs> I don't think that's possible. So it's a thought experiment. Right. So we say okay, we're just gonna we're gonna say that colorblindness is our goal. And every time we see that color interferes with equal access, we're going to fight like heck because mm-hmm. it's a sign that we didn't, in fact, practice color blindness. Mm-hmm. Now, that yeah. would be a different kind of color blindness, wouldn't it? it would Nobody's be really proposing that because that would mean doing what? Admitting that there's racism in the world structured in our society to produce these outcomes. What mm-hmm. they want is color blindness with no correction of advantage. Mm-hmm. They want everything to be built the way it is and to walk around free and clear mm-hmm. is what they want too often of the time. Well, and that's just it, right? Is that what, what you're describing there is it's very pragmatic. It's rooted in the reality we live in and that's where we have to, to live. And that's, I think where we personally, I would agree. We have to start there by acknowledging certain things and, and then work against it. And then we have to change right. people's view of what's happening because they've been fed the other concept that it's not happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with you there. So, okay, last question is, 
so what do we do, right? So how do we, your book mm-hmm. was, was super helpful. There's some stuff at the end where you give suggestions about how mm-hmm. we can ha- counter this. Um, so how do we, you know, identify, you know, a lot of the system interconnections, mm-hmm. reverse outcomes, yeah. transport, discomfort, uh, and exercise courage? Yeah. Well, the first thing is, you know, the first thing is, you know, we have to look at, um, we think about how we seek, how we search for discrimination, how we search for discriminatory uh, p- policies. Normally, we look for the policy that is itself designed to create discrimination. So we just say, if it doesn't say anything, if it has a colorblind narrative, then it's not a discriminatory process. But if the outcomes of that policy mm. produce significant disparity of treatment on the ground, then it doesn't matter what the language says, as far as I'm concerned, it's certainly as far as the system a systems theory would say, a, theor- a systems theorist would say, don't listen to what people tell you a system is for. Mm. You listen to the system. It'll tell you what it's for by outcome. Mm. And that's true whether it's climate change, whether it's any topic you want to pick. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that became a matter of saying, okay, so I see the outcome. Now, how did it happen? Mm. Since there is no rhetoric, right? So the first thing is you have to do that. You have to ask new questions. Approach the problem in a, in a systemic thinking way rather than an isolated one-on-one practice. That's the first thing. To do that well, you have to be open to making a paradigm shift. The paradigm is individual bias and racism is what remains, and society is largely functional. All we have to do is get, pluck a few more bad pieces of fruit, prune a, fru- a few bushes, and we're okay. I'm saying no. It actually is the kinds of outcomes we're seeing all over the country simultaneously are they not about like the planting of a handful of individuals who are racist? It's not going. It's not going to solve it. So that means we have to look for well, what are how are the policies designed now to create this outcome? That means a more curious interrogation of the problems and how they're playing out. And then the next thing is to really you know have a lot of courage, whether you're brown, black, white, or otherwise, because people do not want to hear this. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think there are lots of people who, under the right conditions, will be open to thinking about how these things could continue. And the more fluid they are with this understanding, I think the easier it's going to be for them to imagine ways to fix it that might change their opportunities or change the balance of power. But it might also enrich their lives, create new opportunities, right, and and really make for the kind of changes that would produce a stable, peaceful society. We know that unstable, you know, volatile, non-peaceful societies do not thrive. Mm -hmm. They eventually have to. They just, they don't. Mm -hmm. So we have to get this right. It's not just because I think black people have been just deeply dehumanized and disregarded. And I'm I'm upset and sad and angry about that. It's not the only reason, which should be reason enough. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a realist about, you know, do we want to go, do we want to go down in, you know, in the river here or just, you know, go up in flames or whatever metaphor we want to use? I mean, that's where we're headed. This is not a fight you can keep. You can't have a hundred civil wars, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and, and be a, a stable democracy, especially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, to me, it's about courage. It's about creativity. It's about being open to making a paradigm shift. And then the very last thing that's most important is figuring out um, how to search for leverage points. Mm. Because look, when you tell people about the system, they're like, man, this is too big. I, I got you. I ain't got time for this. I can't. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fix all this. Mm-hmm. We're like, well, you are never going to fix all of it anyway. Mm-hmm. No matter what the analysis framework is. Mm-hmm. So I say, look, focus on leverage points that matter to you, your family, your community, your church, your synagogue, your whatever it is. Like, is it education? Is it about, um, you know, the psychology of, of, um, you know, the mental health crisis that young people are facing? Mm -hmm. Is it about whatever, where your strengths are or where your curiosity rests? And then focus on finding a leverage point in there that will unlock to reduce the meta effects. Mm -hmm. We want a meta justice. Mm -hmm. To get to meta justice, you have to create interconnections that are like really exciting and powerful and generate more opportunity and more oxygen and more creativity. So you want to replace these destructive interconnections to move from a system that takes, extracts, and, and destroys people and, find, and replace them with new leverage points that when you connect them, instead of creating invisible discrimination, it creates visible justice, mm. right? Mm. And that, those, that's, we can do that at a very small level 
And I see this book as my contribution mm-hmm. to that. And you can, and it's maybe not very small. I'll give it a medium small, <laughs> <laughs> a medium small contribution. Um, but we can also do it in our communities. We know some in, in local communities, they know what they need. They know what the problems are. It's just that it's hard to, to think out of the box. And I want people to think out of the box and look for leverage points. They can't fix everything. But mm. some things are very powerful because of what they do in the system. Mm. So mm. I feel like there's a bit of a, you know, a kind of mystery project in it. There's a kind of discovery project. There's a, like a, you know, a puzzle. And then there's also like you, you start realizing that human beings are hurting in so many ways. And so much of it is really not only unnecessary, but um, intentionally generated or just disregarded when people tell you that it's happening. And that's mm. it's just like, you know, it's like we don't there's no need for that. Mm. There really isn't. Um, mm. So anyway, I mean, I guess that would be my hope for people. Creativity, mm. you know, courage, leverage points, paradigm shifts. Mm. Uh, talk to your people around you. And, you know, I see you you talk to people I wouldn't talk to often. You know, people who would be really annoying. <laughs> everybody's different, you know, like I'm happy to talk to any reasonable person, but when they give me fixed talking points from some absurd radio show, not yours, <laughs> um, you know, I was like, okay, well, I, I gotta go. You know, mm-hmm. life mm-hmm. is short. You think you have more time than you do, I promise. And if you spend it not either, you know, just with people who are just using you as a, a battering ram for them to repeat their position, like, I'm not here for that. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're really curious, I'm open to hearing you because I think if, there are things upon which we might agree, but only in the context where you're a real open interlocutor. And if mm-hmm. you're not thinking, you know, there's a million people who want to have that discussion with you. I'm not that person anymore. Mm-hmm. Like I got other things to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and I believe that most people are not like that. Mm-hmm. I believe most people are simply uneducated, undereducated, and, you know, frankly, just distracted into this easy Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, this is this is why I'm I'm so grateful that you 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 came on because I, I felt we could have a really fruitful discussion, which I certainly believe we did, and I, it was very very helpful for me, and I'm certain for listeners. And uh, you really were just super lovely throughout, and how you explain things <laughs> and how you discuss it, really, so genuinely. Well, I appreciate you having me, and of course, you, thank you. You, you. Have, you know, a very you know uh, balanced sort of spirit on the subject, and I hope you're. Pros and cons, friends, don't torture you. <laughs> no, 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 they'll, they'll be fine. And, uh, and I hope 